first speaker this afternoon unfortunately couldn't be here but it's somebody I think that Mr. Bogart knows very well and uh, although the speaker is not here the recording speaks for itself this is Lauren McCall yeah Mrs. Bogart the uninvited guest you rat bastard. <laughs> when Rosie told me that the five was giving a luncheon in his honor, I was delighted. But when he told me that I couldn't attend because it was a stag, well, I sure was disappointed. I said, Bogie, why can't I go? He said, Maybe it's going to be a little rough. You know how men act with a stag. So that's why women aren't allowed. See? Well, I was furious. In fact, I was goddamn mad. What the hell can the fire say that you haven't called me? <laughs> I must tell you of an incident that happened to Bogey before I met him. He was keeping company with a girl. And one day, while he was waiting in front of her house, she wanted Bogey to go to the store for her. So she opened the window and called out, Hot free! Hot free! And 20 guys ran up to her room. You fucking a nice guy like that. After the Falcon, we did another picture across the Pacific, and then the war came, and, and I went away. I remember meeting Bogey in Italy during the war. He was over with an entertainment group. Uh, it was a festive occasion when uh, I met him at the palace at Caserta. Oh, Mr. Bogart, glad to be back. Who's well, well, both to the swell job. Oh, right. Thank you, Mr. Bogart. Thank you. Thank you. Now, give us a lot of How's your trip? Well, how are our boys doing? Our boys are doing a great job. On our trip overseas, my wife and I saw thousands of American boys in Africa and Italy... You can be awfully proud of them. We did the best we could to entertain them. But there's an organization that's looking after them in every theater of the war. That's the American Red Cross. Wherever the armed forces go, there too goes the Red Cross. When our pilots and bombardiers and navigators come back from a mission over Germany, there's a Red Cross clubmobile waiting on the field, ready with coffee and donuts, ready with friendliness. In 1943 and 44, Bogart went on war effort tours with his third wife, Mayo Method, making trips to Italy and North Africa. A man who's worried by bad news from home or, or no news loses his efficiency. He produced shorts for the American Red Cross effort and the Victory Bond Drive. The relationship with Mayo was strained. She accused Bogart of having an affair with Ingrid Bergman during the filming of Casablanca. Bergman later remembered that Bogart barely spoke to her off camera, let alone had an affair. American food, reading rooms, and recreation facilities. Back stateside, Bogart was cast as Steve Morgan for an adaptation of Ernest Hemingway's To Have and Have Not. In casting Slim Browning, Howard Hawks' wife, Nancy Keith, saw a Harper's Bazaar cover that featured an 18-year-old model and actress named Betty Joan Persky. Hawks immediately signed her to a contract. She'd soon change her name to Lauren Bacall. Well, Betty, uh, did you ever see Bogey on the Broadway stage? No, I can't say that I did, Ed. Uh, that was, if you'll pardon me, before my time. Or at least I was in uh, very three-cornered pants at the time. <laughs> but uh, I, I did see him in many motion pictures. And uh, I may say, and this is strictly between us, of course, yes. uh, he was not a favorite of mine. It's only fair that I tell you that. I figured that he was one of those, uh, you know... I, I believed everything that I saw in pictures. And when I first came out here under contract to Howard Hawks, Howard told me that he would like me to appear in my first picture opposite either Cary Grant or Humphrey Bogart. Well, of course, Cary Grant was heaven to me, and Bogart was horror. <laughs> and because I was convinced that Bogart was strictly a these dem and those. Uh, 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 you know, that, ain't, uh, that ain't true, Ed. <laughs> it ain't. Ain't true no how, huh? <laughs> no, it ain't true. Mayo Method had long accused Bogart of affairs with all his co-stars, something he'd actually never done. 
When Bogey and Bacall met, he was attracted to her outspoken personality, poise, looks, and long, lean figure. Bogart kept Bacall at ease during filming, and their chemistry was apparent from the beginning, with their 25-year age difference creating a mentor-student acting dynamic. At first, Bogart made sure his meetings with her were discreet and brief. They wrote heartfelt letters and made sure to be publicly professional, while Bogart encouraged her to steal scenes, delighting Howard Hawks. But when Hawks realized there was more to their chemistry than friendship, he disapproved of the affair. The film premiered on October 11, 1944, while Bogart refused to stop seeing Bacall. His marriage to Mayo Method was finally over. He filed for divorce in February of 1945. I gather the Bogarts are spending the uh, Labor Day weekend at home, is that right? You gather correctly, Ed, we uh, are. Uh, how's the weather out your way? It's pretty muggy here. Oh, the weather out here is absolutely heaven. It's a real chamber of commerce weather, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. <laughs> uh, that looks like an interesting bracelet you're wearing. Is it uh, special for television visitors, or is it just a little thing you picked up somewhere? Oh, no, this is a little thing I picked up somewhere very special. Uh, a fellow by the name of Mr. Bogart gave this to me. Uh, uh, in honor of To Have and Have Not, the first picture in which we appeared in together. Yes. And uh, it was prompted by a line that I said in the picture. Uh, I don't know whether you remember it or not, but the line goes something like this. Uh, if you want anything, all you have to do is whistle. <laughs> you know how to whistle, don't you? <laughs> you just put your lips together and blow. <laughs> the next month, Bogart appeared on the Thursday, March 8, 1945 episode of Suspense in Bill Spears' production of Love's Lovely Counterfeit at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I grew up in the tradition of Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, H. Ryder Haggard, if you will, and, and all of the romantic, how will it come out, can she get away by midnight, people, rather than the clanking chains of the purely ghost story. Not that suspense doesn't sometimes have an element of horror, or that horror doesn't have an element of suspense, but I did not specialize in the clanking chains. Well, Bill, when did suspense go on the air, and were you involved with it from the very first? I was not involved from the very first. The show was conceived by Charles Vanda, V-A-N-D-A, a very wonderful producer and, and great old friend, in California, and it came about in uh, 1940 as part of a series called Forecast, which CBS put on in the summer as a replacement for the Lux Radio Theater, which used to play 46 weeks a year, but took an eight-week hiatus. And up until then, they had just filled the show with anything that the network could find, but we came up with the idea of using that eight weeks as a testing ground, a pilot, it would be called today, a ground, for new shows, one of which was Suspense, another was Duffy's Tavern. Several shows were sold and went on into uh, getting well-known in radio. Some others fell by the wayside. No. Roma Wines presents... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines present Humphrey Bogart in Love's Lovely Counterfeit. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star Mr. Humphrey Bogart who is currently being seen in the Warner Brothers production, To Have and Have Not. Mr. Bogart appears with us tonight in a characteristic tale by James M. Kane, the author of Double Indemnity and other noted contributions to the literature of dangerous adventure and troubled romance. And so, with love's lovely counterfeit, and with the performance of Humphrey Bogart, Roma Wines again hope to keep you in... Suspense! All right, Lefty, open up. Oh, it's you, Ben. 
Come on in, Ben. Sal here yet? No, not yet, but he ought to be pretty soon. Huh? What's he got on his mind? I wouldn't know, Ben. Okay. Hey, what's that coming down the street? Oh, that must be those poor suckers of Citizens League. They're having a political parade. Yeah, there they are. You can see them through the window. That must be Jansen, huh? The guy they're running for mayor. That's right. Who's the doll riding with him? What's the matter? Don't you read the papers? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I read Little Abner. Who's that, Davy May? Her name is June Lyons. She's his new secretary or something, but everybody says she's the brains of his campaign. Yeah? I could use a little brains like that myself. <laughs> not that kind you couldn't, not that missionary kind. What about this Jansen? <laughs> I keep forgetting that you're new around here. Jansen doesn't have a chance. Well, he's putting out a lot of publicity. He must have some dough behind him. Yeah, but you can't elect a reform ticket in a town like this, Ben. Saul's machine is too strong, not unless you got some dirt, some real dirty dirt that smells so bad people can't ignore it. And who's going to get anything on Saul with half of the police force on his payroll? Saul isn't even worried, huh? Ah, why should he be? Saul puts up the dough, Maddox wins again, and Saul keeps on running the town. Oh, that must be Saul now. Hiya, Lefty. Hiya, Benny. Hiya. See your draft board today? Yeah, I saw him. What'd they say? Same thing. I still got that hernia from football. <laughs> that football hernia comes in pretty handy, don't it? And what's that crack supposed to mean? What's the matter, Benny? Can't you take a joke? Sure. I can take a joke. What you got on this afternoon, Benny? I guess you forgot. This is my day off. I said, what you got on this afternoon? Nothing that I can remember now. Why? Little job. What kind of a job? I got a tip. Some friends of mine may be in a little trouble. Something about a bank. Why don't you stick to the bookies and the gambling, Sal? You'd be safer. Listen, Benny. Anytime you think you're big enough to run this business, just let me know. I'll be glad to work something out for you. What's the job? These kids are, are going to crack the Castleton First National just after closing time. They got a room here in this hotel, room 480. They'll be back here about 3.30. You see, I own this hotel, and I want you to go up and collect the room rent. I'm giving them good protection, so I figure it'll come to about 20 grand. Yeah? We'll figure on getting somebody else to collect it. What? Huh? I said get somebody else. I don't like guns, and I don't like gunsels, and you know it. Listen, you punk. You think you're a big guy, don't you? A big guy with muscles, and I'm just a little guy. That's what you think, isn't it? But if you try to cross me, I'll have you crawl under me on your knees. When I get through with you, you'll, you'll, you'll beg me to use a gun on you because you're yellow, aren't you? Aren't you? What's the room number? 480. Come on, Lefty. Yeah, okay. Gee, that was lousy. I'll skip it. You're going to do it, though, aren't you? Sure. I'll see you up there. 315. Oh, by the way, what'd you say that dame's name was? What dame? That dame with Jansen, that brains of the opposition. You mean June Lyons? Yeah, that's it. Now, wait a minute, Ben. You know that's poison if Saul ever thought that... You know, Lefty, Miss Lyons interests me in more ways than one. <laughs> Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Humphrey Bogart, whom you have heard in the first act of Love's Lovely Counterfeit, a radio play from the novel by James M. Kane, which is tonight's tale of suspense presented by Roma Wines. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Mention the name of Elsa Maxwell and you picture a famous hostess, expert in every phase of entertaining. Mention a meal featuring fish or fowl and Elsa Maxwell pictures, but let's hear it in her own words. The thought of a piping hot fish or chicken dinner naturally calls up for me the picture of glasses of chilled Roma Sauterne at each plate. Roma California Sauterne is delicate, pale gold in color, Delightful in bouquet, and even more important, exquisite in taste. Roma Sauterne goes perfectly with any food and tastes as good whether served in ordinary or fancy glasses. The one important thing to remember about this distinguished Sauterne is the name, Roma. 
Each glassful of golden Roma Sauterne reflects the heritage of all Roma wines. Choice grapes, slowly brought to perfection in fertile California's choicest vineyards, then gently pressed, then carefully guided with the ancient winemaking skill of Roma wineries to the full goodness you enjoy in every Roma wine. Roma wines do not vary, are always high in quality of bouquet, color, and flavor. Yet all this Roma wine goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. No wonder more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that Roma Wines bring back to our soundstage Mr. Humphrey Bogart, who in the character of Ben Grace keeps an adventurous rendezvous in Love's Lovely Counterfeit, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Get rolling. Are you... Uh... That's right. Get rolling. So you're June Lyons, the brains of the opposition. What's this hot tip you told me about over the phone? I don't have much time. What's the matter? You worried? Not particularly. Well, you don't have to be. I'm not interested in you. Why do you want to see Jansen elected? Suppose you let me ask the questions. All right. I'll ask you the same one. Why are you working for Johnson? I'm just one of those crazy idealists, mm -hmm. I guess. Just a missionary, huh? Well, Jansen may not be the best man in the world, but at least he isn't hooked up with a racketeer like Saul Casper, the way Maddox is. June. Oh, it's June now, is it? What's your name? Maybe I'll tell you that later, and maybe I won't. Listen, June, if you were one of those earnest kids who stand around on street corners handing out leaflets, I might believe you wanted to reform the world, but you're not. I know that you know that electing Johnson isn't going to reform the world or even reform Lake City. It just doesn't make that much difference. Well, it does to me. But there's something else, too. Like what? If Jansen wins, of course, I'll get a city job out of it. A good one. That's more like it. But I want to explain why. You don't have to explain anything. But I want to. I'm a lawyer. At least I have a degree from law school. And I want to be a good lawyer. If you start out on your own, it can take years. But with the right job at City Hall, you can build up a practice in no time. Okay. As long as it's the dough you're thinking about, we can do business. Oh, it isn't just me. I know. Now, listen. I know. You're a missionary. <laughs> now, listen. If I, if I give you some dirt on Sal Casper that'll send him up for ten years or so, Jansen wins, right? Well, you can prove it. You're going to prove it. Three punks from Chicago are sticking up the castle from First National Bank at about three this afternoon. Sal Casper's hiding them out at his hotel. Room 480. If there's any shooting at the bank and anybody gets killed, it'll be that much better. You'll have them for accessory to murder. You have your people there at four o'clock. I'll take care of the rest. Well, if we come out with this and it can't be proved, it's criminal libel. And that's all Jansen needs to really lose. So, what do you think? I think you're working for Maddox and Casper. Well, that could be. But at least I know my law. What law? The Castleton Bank is insured by the government. That makes the stick-up a federal wrap. If you want the number of the FBI, I'll give it to you. Oh. And for your information, my name is Ben Grace, and I work for Sal Casper. So, I'm not a guy who's in a very good position to go around giving phony tips to the FBI. Uh, you can pull right up here. Why are you doing this? Because I just decided Sal Casper is mean and he's greedy. Is that enough? If you say so. Room 480 at 4 o'clock. Ben. Yeah? Will I see you afterwards? Now don't worry, baby. You'll see me. This episode had a rating of 13.6, winning its time slot against NBC's Frank Morgan show. Playing opposite Bogart was Loreen Tuttle. You see, I always felt that we had to work with an all-physical person. We always worked from the full person, because that's the only honest way to do it. You have, you have to have a person who lives and breathes and walks and is alive. 
rather than just turning on a voice, because you could conjure up if you really had through imagination anything that you wanted to be. That's why I loved it too, because I could play opposite Jimmy Stewart, or Frederick March, or Cary Grant, or Gary Cooper, or Leslie Howard,、mm -hmm. and on the air I could be the most glamorous, gorgeous, tall, black-haired female you've ever seen in your life. Whatever I. Wish to be,、mm -hmm. I could be with my voice. That was the thrilling part to me. Bogart and Lauren Bacall married in a small ceremony at the country home of Bogart's close friend, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Louis Bromfield, on May twenty-first, nineteen forty-five. On August thirtieth, the couple appeared with Frank Sinatra on Command Performance. Turning to the next Command Performance page, we run across the name of、uh, Blind. Pardon me, Mr. Sinatra. What can I do for you, buddy? Uh, uh, well, my name is Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart. That name has a very familiar ring to it. Humphrey Bogart. Oh, sure. You're Lauren Bacall's husband. Now I remember. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm Mr. Bacall. <laughs> Now I have to talk to you about something very important. I'm in big trouble. What did you do? Rob a bank for real? No, no. I I'm serious, Frank. I need your help. Well, what's wrong, Bogie? Well, for the past few days, I've been getting threatening letters, and and I'm scared. See, <laughs> what can I do? Um.、Uh, well, I want to hire you for a bodyguard. <laughs> you want to hire me as a bodyguard? That's right. Well, punch my TS card. A bodyguard. <laughs> Boogie, honest, I'd like to help you out, but that ain't my racket. Oh, but please, Frankie, these threatening letters come from a guy who says he's going to kidnap my wife. Gee, he wants to kidnap your wife? Yeah, and I want you to be Lauren's bodyguard. Well, that's the kind of a body I'd like to guard. <laughs> Now you've got to help me. The thought of someone dry, trying to kidnap my wife is driving me crazy. You don't know what it's like to feel that everything you've worked for can be destroyed by just one person. What do you mean? I don't know what it's like. <laughs> oh,、uh, pardon me, I forgot about Crosby. <laughs> But、uh, Bogey, why me as a bodyguard? There are better singers for that job. Now take Nelson Eddy, for instance. Nelson Eddy? Sure. If anyone got tough with him, he could hit him over the head with a shortening bread. Ah, <laughs>、oh, forget it. Forget about Nelson Eddy. I want you as a bodyguard. Anyone who knows anything about muscles knows it's a small. Wiry type that's really powerful. <laughs> You're a bruiser, Frankie. Yeah, I'm rugged. <laughs> Here, let me feel your muscle. Here, have a good time. <laughs> Dee, Dee, what a muscle! You know how hard the shell of a clam is. Yeah. Well, this is like all the gooey stuff inside. <laughs> Ah,、oh, but that didn't fool me, Frankie. You're a killer.、Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Bogey. I don't want to be a bodyguard. I don't like that type work. Why, Frankie? You're not the type who's afraid of his own shadow, are you? No, I'm the type who hasn't got any. Ah, <laughs>、oh, come on, come on. Please say, say, please say you'll take the job as a bodyguard. Nah, it's too dangerous. You don't last long if you live dangerously. You won't last long if you live normally. <laughs> Besides, there's nothing to worry about. You'll have a gun on each hip. Why must I wear two guns? One gun would tilt you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bogey. It's not for me. Now, but the guy who takes this job will be paid well. Get Lawrence Tibbet. And the guy who takes this job will get plenty of favors from me. Get Andy Russell, buddy. And the guy who takes this job will be around Lauren Bacall day and night. Get Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I'll take the job, Bogey, but I gotta stick around here. Oh well, good, good. Ah, okay. I'll I'll send Lauren right over. You just continue with the show. Right. Now I'd like to introduce a group of regular visitors to command performance. These kids have kicked many a tune around this mellow hall and answered to your many letters. So here they are again, those purveyors of hep harmony, the Pied Pipers. Sure, you might gotta be this or that. 
be this or that? Who can it be if it ain't me? Ah, no, it's not your mother. Can't you see it's gotta be one way or the other? Tell me what I must know if you don't lie. There's a young woman outside to see you. A uh, very pretty young woman? That's right. I told her there must be some mistake. Uh, what's the idea? There's no mistake. Well, there must be. She's over 13. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, Ken. I know who it is, and I'm expecting her. Will you show Miss Lawrence a call in? <laughs> Hello, Miss Bacall. Hello. I'm looking for a bruiser by the name of Sinatra. My name is Sinatra. Well, here's a nickel, little boy. Go get your father. <laughs> I am my father. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm Frank Sinatra. So you're Frank Sinatra. Yeah, I am. The real Frank Sinatra? Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, it could happen to anyone. <laughs> You just don't look like a bodyguard to me. Yeah, well, anyone who knows anything about muscles knows that it's the small, wiry type that's really powerful. I'm a bruiser, I am, that's what. I'm a bruiser. <laughs> then what... <laughs> then why do you hold on to the microphone when you sing? I don't want to fall down or bruise myself. <laughs> <coughs> you know, you're looking at a perfect physical specimen. You know those pictures in the health magazines, the ones that say before and after? Yes. Well, I'm the guy that poses for the one that says not yet. <laughs> well, okay, if Bogey Hyde is my bodyguard, that's good enough for me. I'm gonna need your cooperation. Well, if there's anything you want, just whistle. I ain't got enough air for breathing. She wants me to whistle. <laughs> Well, all I can say is you better keep a sharp lookout. The man who wrote those kidnap letters is probably a desperate killer. Oh, no, he isn't. You're, you're wrong. Oh, you're so wrong, Lauren. The guy who wrote those letters is a good, kind, sweet, talented, brilliant, nice personality, intelligent man. Well, how do you know? I'm the guy that wrote the letters. <laughs> you? Yes, darling. For years, I've worshipped you from afar. I've longed for you, I've needed you, and I've wanted you. Hmm, he talks like a wolf, but he looks like a cocker spaniel. I'm wild about you, Lauren. Wild about you, do you hear? You've kindled a flame in my heart, and through my veins runs a hot Latin corpuscle. <laughs> Why, Frankie, I never suspected. That I'm wild about you? No, that you've got a corpuscle. <laughs> Come close to me, Lauren, my sweet. 
Remember, before you said that if I wanted anything, I just had to whistle. Yes. Uh, what do you want? Never mind, I'm all pooped out from whistling. <laughs> But don't you worry. Right after this show ends, I'm going to carry you off to my faraway mountain hideout. No, no, you brute. Bogey, bogey, safe. Hey, what's going on here? Well, you might as well know the truth, bogey. I'm the guy that wrote those letters, and I'm going to carry your wife away to my mountain hideout. Oh, darn it. <laughs> Why did it have to be one of those small, wiry, powerful guys? <laughs> Step aside, buddy, before I slug you. Who, me? I'm talking to Lauren. Bogey. <laughs> Bogey, you gonna let him get away with this? Well, gee, so small and wiry. <laughs> Don't forget the atomic bomb's pretty small, and Frankie's an atom. <laughs> Could be, but he looks like one that's already been split. <laughs> okay, Bogey, you can take a powder now, kid. Oh, Frankie, now, please, she's my girl. Yeah, well, just oh, try no. and stop me, brother. I'll bash your skull in. <laughs> Boy, I'll break every bone in your body. I'll pulverize you. I'll belt you from one wall. That's what I love about these army riders. They make me so brave all the time. <laughs> well, come on, Lauren. Let's go. Uh, well, goodbye, Bogey. Goodbye, Lauren. Drop me a card. Goodbye, Bogey. Goodbye, Frank. Tune in again tomorrow for the next episode in this thrilling story, Life Can Be Completely Ridiculous. <laughs> Well, Ken, I hope Seaman Second Class Bobby Seidman is satisfied now. <laughs> I'm sure he is, Bogey. You see, folks, Bobby wrote a letter to Command Performance trying to get us to bring him the impossibility of impossibilities. I Frank know, Sinatra... Okay. No, no, no. Frank Sinatra taking Lauren Bacall away from Humphrey Bogart. Come on, baby. We've wasted enough time around here. Let's get a move on. Not so fast there, short, dark, and undernourished. <laughs> Watch out how you talk to me, buddy. Don't forget I'm wiry. Yeah, but well, one more word and I'll pull your plug out. What are you saying? <laughs> Let's sit down on this love seat, baby, while Frankie sings us a song. Okay, Bogey. What if I don't want to sing? You want to sing? That's right, I want to sing. <laughs> If I don't see her each day, I miss her. Gee, what a thrill each time I kiss her. Believe me, I've got a case on Nancy with a laughing face. She takes the winter and makes it summer. Summer could pay some lessons from her. Picture a tomboy in lace. That's Nancy with a laughing face. Have you ever heard mission bells ringing? Well, she'll give you the very same glow. When she speaks, you would think it was singing. Just hear her say, hello. I swear to goodness, you can't resist her. Just give me some time, and she'll have a sister. No angel could replace my Nancy with a laughing face.
Well, man, the old command performance special is off in a cloud of dust, carrying with it Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Victor Borger, the Pied Pipers, and yours truly. This is Frank. I'm off to my mountain hideout alone, Sinatra. <laughs> Saying best wishes from us all. Good night, fellas and girls. See you soon. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.